Hello, this is Mr. White, and this video is on infinite limits. Here are the four exercises I'm going to be doing in this video, as well as the times at which they occur in the video. And before we jump into these algebraically presented uh, exercises here, let's review real quickly graphically what we mean by infinite limits. So here's an image that, uh, from a worksheet that you've probably done not too long ago. And let me tell you what we're actually not going to be doing today. We're not going to be asking the question what happens as x approaches either positive or negative infinity. We could, and we'll, we'll, we will tackle that on another day, although honestly we've, we've tackled it to some degree in pre-calc. But remember that that asks what happens as x goes to negative infinity. What happens is I keep traveling to the left, to the left, to the left, and we see that as I do that, the y value is leveling out at positive 3 in this case. So we put positive 3 here. And again, we, we'll on a later date tackle that, how that would look algebraically, but that's not what we're focusing on today. Um, today we're going to be looking more at um, what happens, for example, right around here, where the x approaches some finite number, like in this case, the x value that we're approaching here is, is negative 7. And we ask what happens to the y value. And we see that the y value is approaching uh, positive or negative infinity. And in this case, when I bring this up here, I ask that you pause the video as needed and just make sure that you completely understand and agree with what you see on the screen now. Um, and specifically, understanding the implication of from the left, from the right, and then nothing at all uh, written there. Um, if not, if that confuses you at all or you don't recall it, please go back and review the video on one-sided limits. But that should make perfect sense. And, and in particular, noticing that when the left-handed limit and the right-handed limit are the same, that is also the two-sided limit. But let's look at a different um, point now. Let's say what happens as um, we are looking in that area. And that looks like an x value of negative 1, right? So once again, if, you, um, if I bring this onto the screen, you should be able to look at all of those and, and agree with them and make sense out of them. We see that as we approach from the left, the y value soars to infinity. As we approach from the right, the y value uh, nosedives to negative infinity. And since those two values do not agree, the two-sided limit is simply does not exist, DNE. Okay? So we're going to be tackling scenarios like that, where x approaches a finite number, like negative 1 in this case, but it's the, the limit itself that either goes to positive or negative infinity, or if they disagree, coming from the left and right, uh, DNE. So let's go back to this and jump into the first, the first two exercises, really. Notice that those first two are awfully similar to each other. Um, I hope you notice the difference. And again, this is part of why I make such a big deal about you writing the limb every time, is because this is important information that really can change the, the, your answer dramatically if you, if you ignore it. But let me move this one off to the side. We'll bring it up here shortly. We could tell there's going to be something in common with what we've got on the screen right now. So how we tackle this is fairly familiar ground. You should have some sense of how we're going to, uh, what, what our first uh, uh, action is, and that is the factor of both the numerator and denominator, right? Now in this case, I'm just going to use a little guess and check. I'm going to make a guess that this is 6x and this is x. Theoretically, it could be 2x and 3x, right? But let's make a guess, and, and when we luck out a little bit, and that that's a 1, because that really means this is either this is a 1 and this is a 1. And um, when I look at my options there, it looks like um, it's not really going to work, right? I could put a plus here and a minus here, or, I, or vice versa. It's not going to work. So let's go back and let's try, um, let's try that 2x and the 3x. There are more formal ways to go about this, but this is the one that most students seem to prefer, just kind of guess and check a little bit. And we see that that looks more promising. I can put a, um, oops, actually no, I can put a minus here and a plus here. And if I were to FOIL that out, I would get the, the numerator. Um, and I'm going to make an educated guess that uh, one of those factors is going to be the same on the bottom. And I can tell it's not going to be the 3x. That, that doesn't, that's not going to give me a 4x squared here. So I'm going to make an educated guess that there's a 2x plus 1 on the bottom. That seems to be something we're presented with quite often. And that would make this other factor be 
2x because 2x times 2x would give me the 4x squared. And I'll also speculate that this must be a minus 3 because those two constants should give me a minus 3 there. And if I just kind of mentally foil all that out, I see that I get 4x squared minus 6x plus 2x. That does successfully give me the minus 4x. And I do successfully get the minus 3. So I have successfully um, factored that. And again, let's put the lin here just so we don't forget. All right, we know that um, we can plug in the hole, so to speak, by doing that. And now I'm asked the question, what happens as x approaches negative 1 half from the positive side? Well, let's um, try our direct substitution now. Um, again, direct substitution a moment ago, um, before plugging in the hole, would have given us indeterminate form, would have given us a big 0 over 0. But we plugged in the hole. And if I plug in a negative 1 half, and I don't really worry about that plus sign. I'll just plug in the negative 1 half. And this would give me negative 3 halves minus 1. That would give me negative 5 halves. And on the bottom, uh, negative, plugging in negative 1 half would give me negative 1 minus 3. That would give me negative 4, right? I'm, I'm looking ahead a step. And I'm going to say, instead of writing negative 4, I'm going to put negative 8 halves. And that way I know. I can cross out the twos there, and I can get positive 5 eighths. And guess what? This plus never really came into the equation. I've just determined that the limit approaching from the left or from the right is positive 5 eighths. And that is my final answer. OK? Now let's look at the uh, alternate problem that I uh, had up here. Again, let me bring it up here on the screen and, and, and observe how it compares, because I'm, I'm going to use some of the same work. Why waste energy, right? Um, notice that I can still factor. I'll still start by factoring. So let me clear up some of this. OK, and again, I even need to um, fix this here. Let's get rid of that and put in a positive 3 halves approaching from the left. And there. So again, I, I can still use the, the factoring there. And I'll still, I'll still plug in the hole that occurred at negative 1 half. But again, I, actually, let me repeat what I just said. The hole here, again, it, it occurred at negative 1 half, not 3 halves. So again, even though I plugged in the hole, it wasn't really, relative, it wasn't really relevant to what's going on at x equals 3 halves. Um, so even though I can, I can cross out those factors, um, notice that when I try to direct substitute now, if I were to try to um, plug in um, for x, if I were to try to plug in a 3 halves now, notice I would get a 0 on the bottom, but not on the top. Notice on the top I would get a um, 9 halves minus 2 halves. I would get a 7 halves over. On the bottom, I'd get a 0. So that is not indeterminate form. That is something different than indeterminate form. Well, what do we do with it? Um, Here's how I approach it. I'm going to say I've never really seen the way that I like to approach it. I've never really seen it presented in a book, um, yet I just feel it makes the most sense for me. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to, um, again, in, in, in approaching 3 halves from the left, that's approaching 1.5 from the left, right? So I'm going to just kind of mentally in my head think 1.5, but a little bit smaller, a little bit to the left of 1.5. So I'm going to mentally in my head kind of think 1.49. Now, if you're wondering, why don't I say 1.499 or 999? That's a valid question, but just roll with me here. I'm going to think 1.49. And when I plug that in here, I'm going to get something on top that still is approximately 7 halves. I'm just going to put approximately 7 halves and not worry too much about that. But the impact that it has on the bottom is that 2 times 1.49 is, is a little bit less than 3, right? So if I take a number that's a little bit less than 3 and I subtract 3, I'm going to get something that is just very slightly negative. Now, if you wanted to be more exact, you could say, well, isn't that negative 0.02? You could, but again, the way I just like to conceptualize this is I th I'm going to put tiny negative number. And I, if this feels a little bit fishy or wishy-washy, not, not quite as rigorous as what we're used to in math, 
I, I invite you to look at how a book approaches it or look at other videos. And if, if you like that better, I'm not offended. But this is the way that I found over the years a lot of students seem to think makes sense. Um, and really think about that. If you take something that's really close to 7 halves, not a huge number, but if we're dividing it by a tiny negative number, that's going to approach a very large negative number. Now, if, it, if you'd rather not write tiny negative number, um, another all, you know, kind of alternative you have is if you want to do some actual math here, some actual number crunching and say that's negative 0 0.02, you may do that if you like. And then what I would invite you to do is say, what happens is I say I'm getting even, even closer to 3 halves. What if I say 1.499? Um, and I plug that in here. Wouldn't this put another zero here? And what if I said neg or 1.4999? Wouldn't that just put another zero in here? And if that really helps convince you that we are getting something that is still approximately 7 halves divided by a, a number that's getting smaller and smaller and smaller, although still negative, that should convince you that we are approaching negative infinity. So we're going to say negative infinity, and that's going to be our answer. And again, the equal sign technically, uh, you know, some mathematicians may really argue and say that that's technically not correct. But remember, we agreed in a previous video that we will say a limit can equal negative or positive infinity, despite what the purists might say. Okay, so. Let's see what that looks like graphically. I think that's an important kind of step to really affirm what we've that what we've done here algebraically is valid. Let's look at what we've done here graphically. Um, notice that when we, in the first problem, when we were approaching negative one half, remember how, remember that one? Remember what we got? We got a y value of 5 eighths. And you can see that approaching either from the left or approaching from the right, we are approaching the same y value, the same whole. So we got 5 eighths. It didn't matter whether we were approaching from left or from the right. Um, however, when we were approaching um, positive 3 halves, that just happened to be where the, where the asymptote is. And so notice that we were approaching from the left, right? And we see just uh, visually that as I approach from the left, sure enough, my y value is going negative, 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 negative. If I had approached from the right, we would have gotten a positive infinity instead. OK, um, pause. Let that sink in if you need to. This is something that I, I could imagine that some students may have a little trouble completely digesting here. But um, I'm going to go ahead and go on to another example here. All right, here's the next one. Um, not really any algebra to do there, but we're going to take a similar approach here. And this is where all my emphasis on unit circle comes into play. You better be comfortable with your unit circle, so that's not what, what stumps us. So here we've got x approaching 3 pi over 2 from the right. And if we start with our direct substitution, if we try to just plug in 3 pi over 2, we're going to get negative 2 over 0. Now, again, that is not in determinate form. So what do I suggest we do? I suggest you really picture what's going on on the unit circle. Um, think about what happens as you are approaching 3 pi over 2. So here's on our unit circle. Here's pi over 2. Here's uh, pi radians. And 3 pi over 2 is perfectly vertical here. But what would 3 pi over 2 from the right look like? What would 3 pi over 2 with the little positive sign up above it mean? That would mean that we're a little bit more, that, that we're approaching from the right, that we're approaching from something that's a little bit bigger than 3 pi over 2, right? So I might draw something like that. And I'll put that that's 3 pi over 2 approaching from the right, as opposed to if I were interested in 3 pi over 2 from the left, I would say that that's the one that's over on this side, 3 pi over 2 from the left. So let's ask ourselves, what's the difference? Well, 3 pi over 2 from the right is looking at this adjacent over this hypotenuse. And we see that's a number that's really approaching 0. Remember, that adjacent is going away. It's approaching 0, but it's, it's a positive number, right? That is definitely a positive adjacent. So I'm going to say that that is going to be, um, how, how would I write this? I might write cosine of 3 pi over 2 plus equals, I'm going to say that's, that's a 0 but it's a tiny positive number. So I might write 0 plus 
Or if I do what I did earlier, I might write tiny positive. And again, that doesn't show up in any math book. That's just something that if you feel comfortable doing it that way, fine. That's like 0.01 or 0.001. Whereas over here on the left, notice that that adjacent is negative. So I'd say a cosine of 3 pi over 2 coming from the left, I didn't write that very well, from the left is going to equal a tiny negative number. It's a tiny adjacent over a hypotenuse that is always positive, right? So this is something that really takes a thorough understanding. You can't really just follow a recipe on these. You really got to think these out. So if I go back to my original problem, to my original exercise, we were approaching 3 pi over 2 from the right. That was this situation, right? So I'm going to put a tiny positive number. And if I have negative 2 over 0 0.01 positive, or 0 .00, positive 0 0.001, or positive 0 0.0001, I can tell that this is going to get, this is going to approach negative infinity. Um, if this had been 3 pi over 2 from the left, that would have been looking at this over here. I would have had tiny negative here, and that would have made this positive, right? So let me bring up the, um, again, let's look at this graphically and try to connect what we're doing algebraically. Um, here's the graphical representation. And as I'm approaching 3 pi over 2, where is that on this graph? Let me, let me put that there. 3 pi over 2 turns out to be over here. And I can see that as I, as I, as I am approaching from the right, which is what this problem asked, right? As I'm approaching from the right, that looks like this. And I see that, sure enough, my y value is, is headed towards negative infinity. Whereas if I had been approaching from the left, it would have been going to positive infinity. All right, this is a, this is a difficult topic to explain. I hope I'm getting through, and I hope you'll, you'll ask if you're having any difficulty with it. Um, let's go on and do the last example. All right, let me move that off the side and bring this up here. So what about x approaches 1 half? Notice there's no, there's no plus or minus there, right? It's just x approaches 1 half. It's a two-sided limit of x squared times tangent of pi x. The x squared probably isn't scaring you too much, but that tangent of pi x maybe make you grimace a little bit. Um, let's think of what's going on there. If I try direct substitution, if I try direct substitution, I'd have a 1 half here, and I'd be taking the tangent of pi over 2, and if I think of what's going on on my unit circle there, um, yeah, the tangent of pi over 2 is going to be undefined, right? Opposite over adjacent. So again, let's ask what happens as I approach from the left or from the right. Now remember, from the left, this might be a little confusing here. If I say from the left, don't think I'm talking about this one. Remember, from the left means if I say x approaches 1 half from the left, that's talking about numbers like, 0.499, right? So that means I'm approaching for um, values that are a little bit smaller than 1 half. So that's actually talking about this over here in the first quadrant. Whereas, uh, and in fact, let me move that over here. Let me organize like this. That's, uh, that's this over here. Whereas x approaching 1 half from the right that means I'm dealing with numbers that are a little bit bigger than 1 half. So like 0 0.501, it's a little bit bigger than 1 half. And therefore, that's talking about this quadrant over here. So don't let that confuse you. And what's going on with the tangent of those numbers? As I look at the tangent here, where x is approaching 1 half from the left, numbers a little smaller than 1 half, I'm going to get an opposite side that is definitely some finite number, some positive finite number, divided by something that is approaching zero, but it's a, it's a positive tiny number. Again, this adjacent is positive and, and small. So I'm going to get um, something like one, that might be my opposite, over an adjacent that is tiny and positive. And that's going to approach infinity, right? As opposed to what's going over, on over here, on um, x approaches 1 half from, from the right, that's where I'd have an opposite that is still positive 1, but an adjacent that is a tiny negative number. This is, 
uh, a tiny negative x value. And so that would be like 1 over a tiny negative number. And that's going to approach negative infinity. So which one are we dealing with here? Well, we are not given a positive or a negative here. So what that means is that uh, we need to consider the one-sided limit and ask, is it the same number coming from the left and from the, from the right? Uh, so if I were to fill in here from the left, what did we say was happening there? We said that's what's going to equal positive infinity, whereas from the right, that's what's going to give us negative infinity, right? Since those two values are not equal to each other, that means that the two-sided limit, which we were asked for, does not exist. I'm going to admit that this is a topic that, since you're doing this presumably over the summer, I really wish we had the opportunity to go over this in class and get your questions answered live. Um, again, I really urge you to contact me if you need any clarification on that. I hope that made sense. Um, and again, I invite you to look at other resources. You may find a way that you would like to approach this better than what I've shown you. Um, but let me go ahead and just show, before I forget, let me go ahead and show you a graphical representation of what we're dealing with here. Um, again, x approaches 1 half. Um, in this picture, I know it's getting awfully cluttered, but we're dealing with what's going on right here. And this is a case where you better be uh, sure you don't just trust your calculator. Notice how the calculator makes it look like this, this center branch just stops right here. But we need to know in our heads, we need to work it out logically that no, that really approaches infinity just like this one on the right approached negative infinity.